You guys are awesome. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna get started. Uh, what I would love to know, because uh, today the topic is focused on uh, cold calling. So we're gonna talk a lot about cold calling. I'm gonna try to answer as many questions and stuff like that that I can for you guys. I would love to know for you personally, when it comes to cold calling, what do you wanna take away from today? Where are you having, when you think about the challenges that you're having, when you think about where you wanna get better, specifically to cold calling, let me know in the chat, what do you wanna take from today? What do you wanna get better at? And I wanna to try to get to as many of these as possible. I'm gonna grab another piece of paper. All right. Yeah, how to handle objections, confidence, how to be disarming. Yeah, objection handling. Yeah, what not to say, culture challenges. That's a really big one. I just got off a training call with a company that focuses uh, in EMEA and everyone is in a different country between Europe and Asia and the Middle East. So that's that's been a really interesting challenge. Uh, voicemails, landing the meeting, convincing people to, okay, so building a little urgency, Andrew, handling objections. Yeah, what to take away. Oh, handling individuals who get very offended. We, yeah, we can definitely talk about that. That'd be a fun one. Yeah, getting past gatekeepers, cool. So let's, yeah, gatekeeper seems to be a theme. Yeah, landing the meeting. Okay, you guys, we're definitely gonna talk about all this stuff. So I'm gonna do things a little differently for this. I don't really have very many slides or anything like that that I wanna run through with you guys. I really wanna do this workshop style. So uh, I want it to be as interactive as possible. So while we're doing this, if any questions come up, feel free to hit me in the chat and uh, we'll get started. Can everyone see the piece of paper and all that stuff? Yeah, see my hand moving around? Yeah, give me a thumbs up. Yeah, you can see me, cool. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. Uh, I wanna walk you through the framework first. So I wanna start high level. How do we wrap our head around the framework? And then what we're gonna talk about is like some really tactical things. So I wanna start sort of high level and then zoom into some specific areas. So the Blissful Prospecting Framework, there's a couple pieces to this. So we're only talking phone today. There's a whole email game to this. There's a LinkedIn game. There's all this other stuff that are really important to landing meetings. We're gonna focus specifically on the phone, but there's three big areas. So the framework is three parts. So what we're gonna talk about today is our ability to identify a good fit prospect. Because you know what? It doesn't matter how good your cold call is if you're talking to the wrong person and you don't know about their world, right? So how do we identify good fit opportunities? And this is three parts. So this is your ICPs, your ideal client profiles, your personas. And then something I've been really big in talking about in the last couple of years is empathy. So this is how well do we know the world of the people that we're reaching out to? So we're gonna focus on this topic today because this is gonna drive cold calls. So how do we learn more about our prospects' priorities and their problems? That's gonna be something big that we cover. Uh, the next piece here, so we have our ability to identify a good fit prospect. We have our ability to engage. So engage is I know who to reach out to. How do I start a conversation with them? So there's three elements to this. So the big one, obviously, we're going to talk about today is phone. What we're not going to spend any time talking about is email. And then there's also uh, sequencing. So how does this all come together? Cold calling is not very effective when you only make one call to someone and leave a voicemail and don't call them back again, <laughs> right? Or if you send an email or two, make a couple phone calls, it's really about this multi-touch sequence. We're not gonna spend a ton of time on this today, so we're gonna spend a ton of time on the phone. And lastly, our ability to convert. So when we think about convert, that's how do we start a conversation with someone, get someone to pick up the phone, reply to an email, and then to actually take a meeting with us. So there's three pieces to this one too. So with convert, there's objection handling, which we are gonna talk about today. There is your ability to secure the meeting, which we'll dig into a little bit of that today, primarily through email. And then lastly, 
there is your ability to execute. So that's more of like the productivity piece. How do I structure my week? All of that good stuff. So what I want to do before we get into the cold calling pieces, I want you to actually grade yourself real quick. We're going to grade ourselves in these three areas, the empathy, the phone, the objection handling. And what I would love to know is if you could write this down, you're going to need it for later. If you could write this down and then also chat what your number is, okay? So I'm going to give you what a one, two, and a three is. Three is the best you could possibly be. One is um, not so great, okay? So on this empathy piece, um, a three is I could speak as the prospect. So if I asked you right now, because I can see a few people, I see Brian, Barron, and Kevin Smith, and Andrew, and Ingrid. So if I asked you, tell me about your prospect, and you're like, my prospect is a VP of so-and-so, um, their top three priorities are this, and the problems that get in the way of them are doing this. If you could speak like that, that's a three, okay? A two is maybe I know some problems that I could solve for them, but I don't really know much about what else goes on in their world outside of my solution and how I can help them. And number one is I have no idea. I just use the talk track that I'm given. I send the cold emails that I'm given. I don't really know much about these people. Let me know in the chat. I'd love to hear from you. What do you rate yourself? I'm seeing some twos. Oh, hey, Anthony, what's going on, man? So we got threes, some 2.5. Yeah, feel free to use decimals too. So we got some twos, some threes. Jordan Greek, what's going on, man? 2.8. Cool. Yeah, Felicia, what's going on? Peter, two. Okay, interesting. Very good. Oh, Dean is a 3.14. He's a pie, it looks like. Uh, thank you, Dean. <laughs> okay, so the empathy piece. Again, we're talking about this today because the talk track is going to be driven by what's going on in your prospect's world. If we don't know what's going on in their world, we can't have a very intelligent conversation with them. Okay, so let's look at phone. So again, we're gonna do the same system here, okay? So a three is, well, let's start with one actually. A one is my conversion rate of people that connect with me is one out of 20 or less. So that's 5%. So that means that I need to talk to at least 20 people to get a meeting. And if you don't know, you're going to have to kind of conservatively guess this, okay? A two is one out of 10. So one out of every 10 people that I connect with on the phone, I can get a qualified meeting from. And number uh, three is one out of four. So I only need to talk to four or fewer people uh, to land a meeting. I'm seeing a lot of ones. Uh, Frank is a 0.1. I think you're being a little hard on yourself, hopefully. <laughs> uh, 0.5s. 0.8s, three ones. Cool. And by the way, I appreciate you. I know we're here in a group and everyone can see each other. I appreciate you guys being a little vulnerable here and putting in your scores. And it looks like a lot of you are being really honest as well. So I appreciate you guys doing that. The point is not to call you out. It's really to help identify a weakness so that we can work on it together. Okay. Lastly, objection handling. Let's do the three, two, one system again. All right. So a three is I can turn objections. So I can get an objection from someone that says not interested or not right now, or it's not in the budget. And I can turn some of those into meetings, right? So think about when I get an objection, a three is I can turn some of these objections into meetings. Two is I know what to say, but I don't execute. So I've seen your content, Jason, on LinkedIn of how we handle not interested. But when someone tells it to me, like actually executing it is a little tough for me. And I don't really get any meetings. And then number one is I have no idea. So I, I kind of wing it every time. So when someone gives me an objection, I don't really have a way to respond to that. I, I kind of just wing it every time. Okay, we got a lot of twos, some 1.5s. Oh, hey, Robin, what's going on, man? Uh, Lydia. Hey, Lydia. Yeah, we got some threes, some 1.5s. Cool. Okay, so my question for you before we dig in here is, of these three areas, which area do you already know that you need to improve in that would have the biggest impact on your ability to get meetings over the phone? When you look at empathy, phone, 
or objection handling, which of those do you feel is the biggest opportunity for you personally to get better at that would lead to more meetings? Jordan says phone, objection handling, phone, objections, phone. Good mix in here. So I think we're going to be talking about the right stuff today. Yeah, phone. Hey, Ramesh. Phone plus empathy. Phone. Cool. Loving the interaction, by the way, you guys. This is cool. All right. By the way, we have 152 people on today. This is pretty cool. Phone. Phone objection. Hand. Okay, cool. We're talking about the right stuff. Okay. Here's what I want to do. So let's talk about the problem first. I want to talk about the approach and then we're going to dig into all this other stuff. Okay. So there's kind of this big problem with outbound right now. And if we look at here, this is our target market, this circle. People are attacking this. Well, actually, let me know. Just give me a little hand raise here in the video. Is anyone here having uh, noticing that it's taking more effort and time to land meetings now than it did maybe a year or two ago? Is anyone experiencing that right now? Let me just raise your hand a little bit in the video. Yeah, a few people. Yes, I'm seeing it in the chat. Yes, okay. You're, well, you're not alone, okay? There's there's a lot of different things going on um, with Outbound right now. It's getting hard to capture people's attention because I don't know about you, but I get a lot of cold calls throughout the day. I get a lot of cold emails too. And people are attacking this problem in one of two ways. On one side, you have this mass blast approach. So the mass blast is if you've ever said our solution is industry agnostic to a prospect, that means you're probably doing this mass blast approach, okay? That is the one thing I cannot stand when someone says our solution is industry agnostic. As a prospect, I'm like, okay, that doesn't really make me feel very special though. So you have this industry agnostic approach and where people are essentially doing this. They're saying, hey, our target market, we're just gonna attack the entire target market like this. We're gonna attack it as a whole. So we're gonna send one to many emails, we're going to make calls that we don't customize. And there's a lot of drawbacks to doing this approach. The volume is very high, but there's very low success rate. Right? There's very low success rate. Uh, and there's low volume of quality meetings. I don't know if you guys have ever sent cold email campaigns out to hundreds of people at a time. But most of the meetings you get from doing that are not very good because they're the type of people that respond to really spammy emails. Like a smart executive is usually not going to respond to something that's really spammy, right? And then the last part of here is lots of rejection. I don't know about you over the phone. When I come into a phone call and I'm not prepared with what I'm talking about and I don't customize it for that person, there's a lot of rejection in doing that, right? A lot of not interested. Did you do your research? You know, people are pretty critical of me, I think, too, because I'm a prospecting guy and a sales trainer and I'm prospecting to people, right? So how do we get the smart executive to respond to us? We'll talk about that, Oliver. We're going to get to it, man. Okay. So we have one approach here. This is one extreme. People are attacking this problem of I can't get a hold of my target market with volume and mass blasting. And on the other end of it, people are doing this. So they're doing this quality approach where everything is 100% customized. And they're basically doing this. This individual right here, I'm going to customize everything for this person, right? I'm going to send emails. I'm going to call them. I'm going to cust every, customize everything for that individual right there. The problem with this approach is that you might have a high success rate. But the biggest challenge is that it's really, really low volume, right? If you're going to customize every email that you send to someone and customize the entire approach, you're not going to be able to reach out to many people. So there's low volume of high quality meetings. So it's just low volume. And there's a lot of talk, especially if you're on LinkedIn right now or consuming podcasts around which approach is better. What do you guys think in the chat? Which approach is better? Is it the mass blast approach or this quality approach? 
Yeah, we got some smart people in here. It's it's a mix. Yeah, <laughs> someone said, of course, mass. Yep, quality. Okay, a lot of you guys are saying a little bit of both. So what we need to do is this approach is how can we break this target market down into like personas or verticals or niches or use cases? And how can we reach out to a small group within the target market? Because if we can find a balance, and I call this a quality first approach, it's not quality only, it's quality first. I'm going to think, how can I make this message sound as good as possible for this individual that's going to receive it and other individuals like them? Yep. And Jeffrey says, yeah, hybrid of both. Use a template somewhat, right? It's a mix of the two. And when we do it this way, we're going to have good success rates. You know, it's not going to be as high as the success rate here. If I did it this way and I customized everything, I might get 75% response rates to an email. But I want more than one meeting a week. You know what I mean? So if I can sacrifice some of the success rates here and not go pure volume, I'm going to have good success rates and I'm going to have the optimized amount of volume of quality meetings. I'm also going to face little rejection. But this right here, this is the approach that we need to align ourselves around, okay? Before we get into cold calling here, there's one really key thing that we need to do, and that's we need to move from, so these are three shifts that we need to make. We either need to move from mass blast or this 100% quality, we need to move from one of these approaches to a quality first approach and find a balance. And then we need to move from me-centric to you-centric. So the cold call framework I'm gonna walk you through does not involve you talking about your solution. You're not going to talk about your solution at all. So these are the two key shifts. Before we even talk about a talk track or what to do in a cold call, we need to make sure that we're quality first and that instead of talking about ourselves, we talk about the prospect. Ideally, you're able to land a meeting without having to pitch the person at all. That's ideal. Okay, I want to go ahead and pause here. Um, what's your biggest takeaway so far? We've walked through the framework. We've identified some areas of weakness. We've talked about the problem and the approach. What's your biggest takeaway so far? And then we're going to get into this first piece here. Let me know in the chat. What's your biggest takeaway so far? Yep, quality first, being you centric super high volume isn't always the best approach. Yeah, finding a balance. Yep, identifying weaknesses, Jeff, uh, Jeffrey says. Yeah, quality first. Yeah, do the work on the front end. Yeah, finding a balance, being you centric. Cool, awesome guys, let's keep moving. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. So I'm gonna focus first on this empathy piece. I'm gonna give you guys an exercise. It's called the problem finder. And what this is gonna help you do is get from either a one to a two or a two to a three. So if you're having trouble speaking your prospect's language, uh, I have some really advanced stuff in here actually too. So we're going to talk about how to build the language for the phone. So there's a couple of things that we're going to do here. So let me move this over. All right. So it's called the problem finder. So what we're going to do, and we could actually call this the problem and priority finder. So the problem is that if we don't know, well, here, let me ask you this. Have you done the job of the people you're prospecting and selling to? Have you done their job before? I'm seeing a lot of now. Yeah, that's the problem, <laughs> right? The problem is that we haven't done the job of the person we're prospecting to. So it's really hard. And Ron has, it looks like. Brian has sometimes. So you guys are at a little bit of an advantage if you've done that. If we haven't done that, it's really hard to have a good conversation with someone if we've never sat in their seat before. So here's some little hacks and some things that you can do to sit in the seat of the people that we're reaching out to. So if we look at this chart, what we have here at the top is we have higher value activities and we have lower value. And I say higher and lower because these lower value activities, they're not bad ideas. It's just the stuff up here is going to be more useful for you. And then here we have lower effort and then higher effort. 
So this is how much time is it going to take for you to do this activity to find out your prospect's problems and priorities, right? Lower value, higher value, lower effort, higher effort. Okay, so let's start up here. So these are the highest value, highest effort activities you can do. Uh, so one you may have heard of, talked about a lot is a customer interview. So if you are a full cycle sales rep, it's a little bit harder. If we, if you're a BDR or SDR, that, that one's going to be a little harder. But if there's people that you've sold to in the last six months, I would set up a client interview and I would ask them, you know, hey, what problem did you have that made you come to us? Why did you decide to take a conversation with me? And if you can go back and reverse engineer what problem they were having, how they wanted to solve it. So, hey, once you figured out the problem you had, what made you decide to look for a way to fix it instead of doing it in-house? Right? You can figure out all that stuff. Um, another big one, too, that's a really good question that you can ask is, was there anything that you were skeptical about before booking with me? You know, before closing with us, before becoming a customer or a client, it depends on what you sell, right? Customers versus clients. Uh, was there anything that you're skeptical about? So those are three questions that you can ask that are pretty good. So talk to your actual customers. That's a good one. Uh, the other one too is customer success. So in SaaS, we call it customer success, right? If we're selling software, talk to someone in customer success and ask them, why do our clients love us so much? What problems are we fixing for them? Because these are the people that interact and do the delivery. Um, so customer success, if you're selling services or professional services, that might be the delivery team. So if you're a marketing agency, that might be the people, the account managers that are actually working with the individual prospects. So you got customer success. Uh, you can talk to other reps. Uh, so a little hack here. One thing that a guy, uh, Jed, his name's Jed uh, Marley. He is the top rep at a company called PandaDoc. If you haven't heard of them, they're one of the uh, go-to solutions for electronic proposal and contract software. What Jed does is in his CRM in Salesforce, he'll look at all the emails that his team is sending that has landed meetings. So if you have reps that are sending cold emails, either look at them through your CRM or ask if they could forward them to you so you could see what they're doing that's working. So don't try to reinvent the wheel, right? So talk to other reps at your company. If you're not the top rep at your company, talk. You should be best friends with the top rep. Ask them what's working. Right, that's something that you can do. Uh, here's another really good one. Coworkers that fit persona. So one of the things that you can do, so if you're prospecting into CFOs, let's say, and you're selling finance software or some sort of service, talk to the CFO at your company. And you know what you can get them to do? I think you guys will get a kick out of this. Let me show you. Okay. If you can get someone on your executive team to show you this, it'll just, it'll blow your mind. Get them to show you their inbox. So I save all the cold emails that I get. You know what I find just so funny is that if anyone did research on my company, they would know that we help people with cold outreach and they would not send cold outreach like this. This is how I know that they're mass blasting. Get them to show you their inbox so you can see what's in there. Because if you can see what's in there, you can figure out how to be different. Look how most of these emails start. And the, their cold calls start the same way. Uh, and I can see Jasmine here in the in the video. So I'll use Jasmine's name. Most cold calls sound, hey, Jasmine, Jason with Blissful Prospecting. Uh, we run a sales training company and we work with companies like XYZ and the results have been really great. We're helping companies uh, set more meetings uh, with their ideal clients without all the rejection. I'd love to you know, unpack this further with you later that it's like, dude, come on, right? So this is how most people cold call and cold email. So if you can get an executive at your company to show you their inbox so that you can see what kind of emails they're getting, that's a really, really cool activity that you could do. So coworkers that fit the persona, and then you can also do research calls. So you could just reach out to people through LinkedIn that fit your ideal persona, and you could ask them if you could do a research call. 
Don't sell to them in those calls though. Or just ask them if you can do a research call. Hey, I'm trying to learn more about people like you and what you really care about so that people like me um, can have smarter conversations. Are you down to, to hop on a call? So those are some higher value, higher effort activities that you can do. What's one of these activities for you? What's one that you think that you could do? If you had to pick one, let me know in the chat. What, what is one of the activities you think that you could do? Yeah, research calls. Yeah, talk to persona, Ryan says. Yeah, customer interview. Yeah, past customer research. Yeah, this one is the heaviest lift here. But this is, you're going to get the most bang for your buck here. Doing customer interviews. <laughs> Alice says the inboxy thingy. Yep. Research calls. Cool. Just making sure you guys are still alive out there. Okay. All right. So let's go into the lower effort, higher value tasks. So one of them is your sales calls. There's a question that I want you to ask. If you're doing the sales calls or discovery, there's a question I want you to ask every single time. And I want you to write down word for word what the answer is. You're going to ask the prospect. You're going to say, uh, hey, Jeffrey, I know you're probably working on a hundred different things right now, but I'm really curious. What are your top two or three priorities? What's most important to you right now? And what you're going to find is that people say things like, um, yeah, I'm really, you know, focused on reducing uh, risk in the content that our brokers are sharing with their prospective clients. I want to make sure that they're not sharing stuff that they shouldn't be sharing that might put our company at risk. You're going to get really, really specific stuff like that. That's going to be more than, oh, we're trying to set more meetings. That's not specific enough. So ask them at the beginning, hey, I know you're probably working on a hundred different things right now, but what are your top two priorities if you don't mind sharing? And write that down word for word. That is how we're going to start our talk track that we're going to get to here in a second next. So your sales calls, ask people, what are your priorities? What's getting in the way? And I find that most people are asking these in sales calls. They're just not writing it down. So either write it down or record it one or the other. So your sales calls, uh, you also have recordings of calls and demos. So if you're at an SDR and you're doing prospecting, let's say, and you're not able to do the sales calls, listen to recordings of your AEs doing calls. And if you're recording your calls, which I highly suggest that you do, go back through and listen to them. Listen to what problems people talked about and what their priorities were. You're going to get a lot of little goodies here. So another one, I've got another hack for you is case studies. So you can look at yours. I know Jordan Greek, you're on the call. I talked to you about this in our boot camp uh, when you were participating actually. And I was like, hey, have you looked at the, cust the uh, case studies? And I believe it was you. You're like, yeah, I have kind of. I was like, well, did you notice there's some really good quotes in there that you might be able to use for your emails? And there's just sort of like an aha moment there. So with your case studies, if you have good case studies at your company, make sure you know those case studies inside and out. And look at your competitor's case studies because there's some really good language in there too. I know that we hate our competitors, <laughs> but take a look at their website and their case studies and their testimonials and look at the language that they use. You're going to find a lot of really cool, interesting stuff. Uh, Anthony, uh, do, we, do I do my calling through Apollo? Yes, I do, so that it's recorded. So case studies are a big one. Um, another one is reviews. Yeah, Jasmine says, I get tons of goodies from competitors' case studies. Yeah, there's just so much, Jasmine, right? Um, yeah, Lydia, yeah, I love harvesting competitors' content. For some reason, when I saw harvesting Lydia, I thought of organs, and it just I just went into a really sick and twisted uh, direction with that. Um, so reviews. So if you sell software, g2.com is a really good one. But with reviews, what you're going to do is look at, so if you sell insurance, just go to insurance review site, right? Um, if you sell software, go to g2.com. And what you're going to look for is what do people say in their two-star reviews, their three-star reviews, their fours? Don't worry about the ones and the fives. The ones are usually people that are unreasonable, in my opinion. And the fives are like fake. They feel fake. So look at the two, three, and four-star reviews for your company and for your competitors. And what you're going to start to find out is what people like and don't like about what's out there. And Jordan says... Uh, 
Yeah, dropping a quote in the email is a nice way to guide them to the attached, uh, attached case study. Yep, exactly. So you get reviews. Um, here's another little interesting one too, is job descriptions. So one thing that's really interesting is that when you look at job descriptions, so look at the job description of like, go to indeed.com and look for, you know, if I'm prospecting to a director of sales, let's say, for example, I'm going to type in director of sales in indeed.com and I'm going to look at the job descriptions for people that are hiring for uh, the position that I'm prospecting to. Because you know what they have a lot of times in job descriptions is the company goals and what the person will be working on. So it helps you kind of fill in the blanks a little bit. For the people you're prospecting to as well, look at the careers page and the job descriptions of the departments you're prospecting into. Hey, Paul, all good, man. It's uh, this, this meeting's being recorded, so we'll send it out to you afterwards. Good to have you here. So uh, with your job descriptions though, let's say I'm marketing uh, a prospecting to VPs of marketing. If I look at the job descriptions of marketing positions, even if it's not for a VP of marketing, oftentimes they'll say, we're hiring a marketing manager to do X, Y, and Z. And they put the initiative and the priority that this person is going to be responsible for. There's just gold in there, you guys. So you're going to figure out all kinds of things about what the company's working on. And the whole point of this is if you did, um, if you did like some of the activities here, if you did 10 between all five of these, if you looked at 10 case studies or 10 reviews, or you listened to five to 10 recordings, you're going to look for patterns. You're going to look for patterns in the problems they talk about and what is top of mind for them. Uh, that's Those are the goodies. So you should have a Word document or a spreadsheet or something where you're gathering the insights and the information. Okay. Lastly, we have blogs. We have industry reports. The reason why I put these down here is that these are really low effort things to go find blogs and industry reports. I don't find them as valuable as these activities. And again, that doesn't mean that they're not worth doing. You might be in an industry with you know, people that are really influential. Um, another thing I just thought of this actually is find industry influencers. So you know what I would do if my ideal prospect was, well, which it is, you know, my ideal prospect is VPs of sales and directors of sales. I would listen to podcasts like mine. I would consume content like mine. I would follow up my competitors, right? So think about for the industries that you're marketing. So if you're uh, prospecting into finance, find who the industry influencers are that talk about finance. Who are the consultants that help CFOs? Who are the coaches? Who are the people that got podcasts, blogs, big platforms, right? That throw conferences, whatever. Find the industry influencers. Um, and then lastly, we have industry events. That's a really good place to find influencers, people that are speaking at events. We got social, you know, podcasts, webinars. I find that these are a little bit higher effort because you got to sit and listen to podcasts, right? You got to sit and listen to a webinar. Okay, before we move to the cold call piece, uh, I want to know what is one action item that you have? What is one of these things that you're going to do after this call? And it may have been something that you already talked about, but I'd love to hear in the chat. What's one action item for you here? Yep, career page, Shawnee says. Research calls and customer interview, job descriptions. Yeah, case studies, Paula says. Yeah, case studies. It's, just, it's such an underrated uh, piece of the equation. You guys, this is the cheat code. If there's a cheat code to outbound, it's this, okay? And I say cheat code, I don't mean like a cheat code you can Google and find and start using it right away. I mean a cheat code that takes a lot of effort to set up. If you know these things, cold calling actually becomes a very pretty simple, straightforward thing to do. I'm not gonna say it's easy, but it becomes very simple. And the way that you can increase the conversion rate in your cold calls is to talk more about their world. Yeah, I love all this stuff. Really good takeaways, you guys. Sweet. All right, you guys are rock stars. Okay, let's go to the next piece. Okay, so we got about 20 minutes left. We may not get to objection handling quite, but um, 
I want to really do a deep dive into cold calling. It, just give me a, a number one in the chat. Are you guys good? If we don't have enough time, would you rather me do a deep dive into cold calling or to lightly go through cold calling and objection handling? I'm thinking it would be best if we did a deep dive into cold calling. So if you want me to do the deep dive, yeah, put deep dive into the chat, actually. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. So I want to show you something real quick. Um, this is so, so important. And the reason why I want to show you this is just the opportunity that you're going to have. So I want to tell you about, so there's a few people on this call that have actually participated in our boot camps, but um, so you guys can see the picture here with uh, Ethan on it. Can you guys see that? Just give me a nod in the, yeah. Um, so what I'm going to walk you through is the process that Ethan used. Um, so Ethan Parker is an AE at Brandcast. Uh, the problem that he had, and this is why I asked you about cold calling, is that it took him about 15 cold call connects to create a meeting. So think about how hard it is to get someone on the phone, and he had to connect with 15 people to get a meeting. And one of the big reasons for that was that he, up to that point in his career, most of the time he was prospecting directly to a small business owner. So he was talking to the decision maker every time, and it was the person using the product. So what we worked on together was how do we prospect to VP and C-level executives? So this prospect path and the problem finder exercise is something that he really worked on. And the structure I'm about to show you is what he did to increase his cold call connect to book meeting ratio from seven and a half to three, uh, 30%. So he went from one out of every 15 to about one out of every three. So it's really, really important that you guys do this problem finder stuff. I know that everyone wants to know about scripts and like what to say and like all this stuff. But you know what? You can make up for a lot of doing the perfect intro and all that stuff. You can make up for a lot of that just by being really intelligent about talking to their problems. So I just want to reiterate that there's no magic formula here, but if there was a cheat code, it would be talking to their problems and their priorities. So if you can lead the call with that, you're going to have a much higher success rate because you're going to filter the conversation. You're going to give the prospect perspective and demonstrate business acumen. Um, so Christine says, how many cold calls are you guys averaging per day? Um, that'd be really interesting, actually, if you guys want to throw it into the chat, how many cold calls that you're doing per day? I'd love to see that too. Yeah, 50, 60. What would be interesting too is the number of cold calls and how many connects do you get? So if you're calling 60 people, how many people actually pick up that you get a chance to talk to? I'd love to see that stat. Yeah, so two connects, maybe three. Yeah, so Sarah said maybe three. So it's like, hey, this could be the difference between getting a meeting from one of those three or not getting a meeting the entire week, <laughs> you know? So, okay, let's go through the structure. Again, love the participation, you guys. Uh, this is a lot of fun. Okay, so with your cold calling, what we want to do is we want to break this up into three sections. So I break this up into an intro. We have a hook. And then we have a close. So intro, hook, close. So your intro is typically going to be the first 15 to 30 seconds. Now, I want to reverse engineer this because the way that we typically cold call and the reason why it doesn't work well is that we think about what we want to accomplish in the cold call instead of what the prospect needs to accomplish during the cold call. So I want to chunk this and think from the prospect's perspective, what do they need to get from the introduction of the call? What needs to happen in order for them to want to proceed to the next step, right? To be okay with you asking them some questions. So what we want to do is start with their world first. We're going to do this in a couple of different ways. Okay, the very first thing that we're going to do is remove the surprise. So removing the surprise sounds like this. Hey, Lucy. This is Jason with Blissful Prospecting. Name, company. You can do full name. You can do first name, whatever you want. I'm not going to come in super hyped, nothing like that. Hey, Ingrid, Jason with Blissful Prospecting. And if you don't know if it's the person because they didn't answer, hey, this is Jason, you could say, hey, is this Jason? Yeah. Hey, Jason, this is so-and-so with ABC Company. Say it exactly in that tone. Remove the surprise. Introduce yourself at the very top of the call, name, company. The next thing that you're going to do is use a permission-based opener. So a permission-based opener 
It's based on this little simple formula. So I'm going to talk to you about how you can create your own here. So you're going to use this empathize. So you're going to talk to something going on in their world. Or in, in, sorry, you're going to talk to what you think they're feeling. We're going to get to the world part here. That's going to be the third part. So it's empathize plus time plus ask. So it's going to sound something like this. Uh, hey, Artem, this is Jason with Blissful Prospecting. Uh, you know, I know I probably caught you in the middle of something, but do you have a minute for me to tell you why I'm calling? Then you can let me know if you want to keep chatting. Boom. So I'm allowing the person to opt in to the call. Now, what I hear oftentimes is, well, Jason, if you give the person a choice and you ask them if you can talk to them, can't they say no? Yeah, they could. That's the whole point. When we give the prospect autonomy and we allow them to say yes or no, people are more inclined to say yes. Think about when you for feel forced to do something because your boss tells you to do something <laughs> or maybe your husband or wife, you know, <laughs> or your mom or dad when you were a little kid, whatever, right? When someone says, yeah, you need to do this. It's like, eh, I don't think so. It makes the rebel in you come out, right? So yeah, Sarah said they feel some type of responsibility. I want them to feel like they're like they have a choice in the call. Because if I ask them for 30 seconds or a minute or whatever, I at least know that I'm going to get 15, 30, 45 seconds, 60 seconds where they're actually paying attention. It's a total pattern interrupt too. So the way that you can customize this for you is you don't have to say, hey, I know I probably caught you in the middle of something. Sometimes what I'll say is if I catch someone in the morning, and I'm calling them at eight o'clock in the morning, their time, let's say, I might say, uh, hey, Lucy, I, hey, I know it's eight o'clock and you put a ton of meetings scheduled the rest of the day, so I'll make this quick. Do you have about 30 seconds? I can tell you why I'm calling and then you can let me know if you want to keep chatting. Eight or nine times out of 10, people say yes. They let you have your 30, 45 seconds. All right, I want to go in and pause here. What, how do you guys feel about the permission-based opener? Because I, I usually get some resistance with this and people are like, oh, it sounds kind of salesy, Jason. I don't know about this, right? What do you guys think? Do you use permission-based openers? Do you have any resistance towards using them? Let me know in the chat. Yep, love it. Use it all the time, it works. Jordan says it's legit. Ryan Turner, I use it and it works. Find it good, works for me. I use it. Haven't until now, but I will try. Yeah, definitely try it, Alice. Yep. Cool. So Lay said sometimes it works. Um, Lay, do you want to take yourself off mute real quick, actually? Let's help you out. You there? Does it let you take yourself off mute, actually? I don't, I don't even know if it does that. I don't know if Lay is, is able to talk. Yep, you have to unmute. So, okay. Does anyone else have challenges with their permission-based opener? If not, we can keep rolling. Yeah. Okay. Hey. There you are. I'm Lee. here. So, yeah. So, what happens when people don't say, "Yeah, go ahead"? What 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 is the response that you get? Um not available sometimes not available at the moment yeah i'm not available at the moment okay yeah okay so i'm gonna go sometimes ahead and put you back on they're not available. yeah okay i'm gonna go ahead and put you back on mute lay i heard what you said there so sometimes they say they're not available or maybe they might say not interested um so one of the things that you guys can do i know we're not talking about objection handling hey is uh, what you can do is just acknowledge. So the, the framework is Eva. The empathize, validate, offer. So you can say something like this. So if someone's like, hey, you know, I'm not available right now to talk or not interested. You say, hey, sounds like I totally caught you in the middle of something. And if that's the case, all good. I know it's not the best time to take random calls sometimes. But, you know, again, I did some research on you. Do you got... Maybe a minute I could tell you why I'm calling. You could let me know if it makes sense to chat now or sometime later. All right. So if you just acknowledge that, that can work quite a bit too. Yep. Okay. So after you do your permission-based opener, this is where you're going to talk about priorities. 
Okay. So what you're going to do here is, so this is what Ethan is doing that's working really well, is he'll do permission-based opener. The person says, yeah, go ahead. And he'll say, hey, Artem, you know, in the conversations that I'm having with, you know, other VPs of marketing, typically one of three things is a focus. And I'm really curious which of these is a focus for you. Uh, one, uh, reducing risk. So with the brokers that you're managing and you're working with, how do you control the content that they're sharing during the sales process? So you get, they aren't sharing anything they shouldn't be. Uh, number two, how are you increasing win rates? So thinking about when we go through the proposal process with a client, how do we provide these you know, personalized experiences at scale? And you know, how do we control that? And then three, demand gen and lead gen. You know, how do we essentially get more leads for less money? Which one of those is a focus for you right now? So notice that I'm extremely specific. So I can't say, hey, um, like if I was prospecting to a VP of sales, hey, uh, when I talk to most VPs of sales, uh, usually what they're most focused on is one, increasing revenue, and then two, landing more meetings. That's not specific enough. So if I can get really specific using the exercises that we used here, asking about their priorities, I'm going to start to find patterns. And I need to mention those patterns at the very top. And if you pull this off correctly, this allows you to filter the conversation into one or two of those priorities so that the hook and the close, it becomes centered around things that they actually want to talk about. So this piece here, typically when I talk to people like you, they're focused on one of three things and you list out the three things and it's gotta be super specific to what they say when you ask them in sales calls. Now, once you do this, what's pretty cool is this hook piece, you're going to do what's called question stacking. So here, what you're gonna do is you're gonna connect to the problem. So, and the way you're gonna do this, so question stacking is asking how based questions. So I'm going to stack context in front of the question. So the questions are gonna follow this format, context plus question. I know there's a lot of chicken scratch on here too, so I appreciate you guys, <laughs> you guys working with me on this. So context plus question. So let's say when we're doing the priorities piece here, let's say they're like, oh yeah, reducing risk is definitely something that we're thinking about right now. Yeah, the content, I'm, we're definitely trying to control the content that our brokers share with their clients. So what I'm gonna do now is instead of asking, well, what's your biggest challenge with that? I'm gonna provide an example of something that I hear a lot of people talk about. And I'm gonna ask how they handle that, right? So with the context, Ethan says something like this. Um, well, interesting. Yeah, so it sounds like reducing risk and the content that you're sharing is a really big focus. A lot of the folks I talk to are using you know, different kind of software and CMS systems to manage the content. I'm really curious, how are you guys managing the content? How do you manage the content that your brokers get to share? So when I ask a how-oriented question, I get them to talk about what they're doing. So if I was going through the context of, of me selling into salespeople, it might be like, um, hey, one of the big priorities I hear is that um, you know, one of the biggest opportunities is to get your reps to pick up the phone more. And a big challenge that I hear that gets in the way of that is call reluctance. I'm really curious, how do you guys train around call reluctance and help reps overcome that so they can set more meetings over the phone? And they'll talk about it, right? They'll talk about their training process or whatever other things that they're working on. So these how-oriented questions, I'm going to stack context into that question. Now, lastly, what I'm going to do to close this off is I'm going to summarize. And I'm going to do three things. So I'm going to get agreement. So when the person says, uh, yeah, you know, we use all these different systems, yada, 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 and I get some problems out of them through these two or three highly targeted questions, I'm just going to summarize it back to them. Uh, you know, hey, David, what I heard you say was, this is a priority right now. This is a problem for you. The get agreement piece is, did I miss anything? Is there anything that I missed? So I'm making this about them, right? I'm asking questions. I haven't even talked about my solution. 
I'm asking questions about them. I'm summarizing what I heard about them and I'm getting agreement to make sure that I didn't miss anything. Then this next part becomes really easy. Scheduling time. So by the way, this is the first 15, 30 seconds. This might be the first, you know, one to five minutes. And this might take one to two minutes here. The best cold calls are, are a little bit longer than three or four or five minutes. So I'm going to schedule time and I'm just going to say, hey, uh, is it okay if I make a suggestion? Yeah, everything that you shared today is something that we hear from a lot of our clients and I think that we could help you with. Do you have your calendar handy? And I'm going to schedule time. And I'm going to do a triple confirmation. So triple confirmation works like this. I'm going to send them a calendar invite on the call and get them to accept it. I'm going to confirm the agenda. And then if I send an email to them with more information, I'm going to let them know that that's on its way too. So I'm going to get them to accept. This is really big with show rates. Get them to accept the calendar invite on the call while you have them and say, hey, so just so you know, what we'll be talking about. So the agenda is going to be the thing that you heard them talk about. We're going to talk about X, Y, and Z, the things that they shared about that you summarized that you got agreement around. You're going to have them confirm that. You're going to make it about them. And then let them know if you send a confirmation email, let them know that an email is on the way. Okay, we have five minutes, you guys. We're running up on time. So what I would love to know uh, from you today is two things. We'll start with the first one. Uh, what would it mean for you if you were able to set more meetings over the phone with your prospects? What would that mean for you and your pipeline if you were able to get an extra meeting or two, let's say, per week over the phone? Let me know in the chat. Yeah, hey, Chris. <laughs> Thanks, man. Thanks, Ron. Um, if you were able to land another one or two extra meetings over the phone calls that you're doing, what would that do for you? Would it help you exceed your quota? Would you feel more confident? Would you get a promotion? Whatever it is, I'd love to know from you in the chat. What would it mean for you? if you were able to set another one or two meetings over the phone. Christine, making that money, making that cheddar. I love money, so definitely. Yeah, we close more new logos, cool. What else? Yeah, exceed quota, Jasmine says. Know that the outbound strategy is working, Dane says. Uh, Ramesh, potentially grow sales ops by 20%. Surpassing quota would feel less pressure on myself. Yeah, Lydia, help you reach your revenue goal, cool. SDR skills developed, become a beast, as Samora says. <laughs> Love it. Team growth, moving to closing. All right, cool. Dude, awesome. Awesome work today, everyone. I got one more announcement as well. I mentioned the boot camp before. I'm going to talk about that for a couple of minutes. If you don't want to hear about the boot camp, feel free, you can hop off. You're not going to hurt my feelings or anything like that. Um, but I want to talk about how you could get some more help if you want it. So one way, obviously, is you can sit here and watch the webinars and listen to our podcast and all of this other stuff, right? That's really great. It's going to require you to kind of apply this stuff without feedback. Uh, we do have a prospecting boot camp. So that's what I showed you today that Ethan's a part of. There's a couple of people on the call today. Jordan uh, went through the, the boot camp as well. If you're looking to get some more personalized help uh, from me, so putting together your talk track, getting feedback on your calls, uh, one thing that we didn't even talk about today was cold email, uh, personalization, ICPs and personas. Se we didn't talk about any sequencing type of stuff. So if you guys want some more information on that, just put the word chat in the chat, put help into the chat, and I'll follow up with you afterwards. I'm going to send an email out to everyone. Um, yeah, just put the word help in there and I'll give you some more information on it. Um, we've had some really cool, uh, Jordan's gone through it, Ethan, who I showed you, another guy, Joel French. His big challenge, we didn't get to talk about objections, was how to objection handle. You know, so he uh, was an SDR, BDR that prospected into VPs of IT. <laughs> so he was talking to people that were several years his senior, whose job he had never done before. And that Evo framework that we talked about really helped him be more confident in calls and turn around some of those objections. So yeah, if you guys want some help and some more information on the bootcamp, let me know in the chat. We got two more minutes here. Um, does anyone have any other questions, thoughts, anything like that, that I can help you with in the chat? If not, I appreciate you guys coming and showing up and 
I'll send an email out to you guys afterwards on the on the boot camp if you want some more information on it. We also have um I'm doing a hundred off uh coupon too for anyone that showed up to the webinar. So keep keep your eye out for that in the email as well. Um okay, so we got a couple questions here. So Ramesh, how is this different on LinkedIn for connections? The process is very different actually <laughs> on LinkedIn. It's using a lot of the same messaging, but LinkedIn is very different from email in that it's actually more like a cold call in terms of the conversational type of elements that you're using and how to go back and forth with someone. I think the big mistake that people make in LinkedIn is they pitch uh, way too soon. It's like this first message is, I'd like to hop on a call with you for this, this, this reason. That's the same thing as hopping on a cold call with someone and then pitching right away for a meeting. That's the big mistake. Um, yeah, Jamie, do you have a script or template you could share? Um, I do. That's more of what people get in the boot camp. Um, everything else is like an outline. The script is something that you actually create. I don't believe in just handing you a cookie cutter script. It's something that you create. And we could do that together in the boot camp. Um, Pete, cell phones, most contacts are on cell. Any way to finesse this, get their cell phone number. <laughs> so um, there's a couple ways that you can do that. Uh, I like Apollo. That's a tool that you could use. You could use Zoom Info, which is pretty expensive. You could use Rocket Reach. You could use Lead IQ. There's a lot of different tools that you can use, but get the cell phone numbers. Um, thank you for the question, Pete. Trudy, yes, the video will definitely be available later. I'll send it out. Is it worth it to leave various voicemails? Yes, absolutely, Sarah. If a call goes to voicemail, what needs to be said? Uh, long story short with voicemails, if you're really straight to the point, I like to point people back to the email that I sent them. So I might say something, hey, Laura, um, I just sent you an email and the subject line is voicemail from Jason Bay. And I think you're gonna find some really interesting stuff in there, no need to call me back. Go ahead and check out the email that I sent you. The subject line is voicemail from Jason Bay. Right, that's how I recommend leaving voicemails. Okay. Yeah, when you call their cell, how the F did you get my cell? Peter says, uh, Pete says, excuse me. I would just be really honest. Um, dude, Pete, great question. To be honest with you, I use a tool called Apollo. Uh, dot io to get cell phone numbers and and really it's just a more effective way to get a hold of people but i totally understand if that's that's a frustrating experience for you because you didn't give me your cell phone but if you're willing i'd love to take a minute to tell you why i'm calling you could let me know if you want to keep chatting just agree with them don't don't argue with them and be super transparent about it uh jasmine can you speak to silence in your calls i know some are effective with never pausing others swear by zip lips to get the prospect to engage i like asking a question and then not saying anything i just let them talk a second or two of silence is totally okay. There's nothing wrong with silence. You know, think about in your personal life, the best relationships, like think about like my wife and I can chill on the couch and not talk. And it's not an awkward experience. We don't have to fill every single second of the day that we're around each other with talking. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so um, it's okay if there's a little bit of silence. This and this um, good. good Good question, Jasmine. I don't know who that is, but uh, I'm going to mute you. Um, yeah, next Zoom is starting, then cold calling. Can't wait to try this out. Good luck, Ray. Yeah, Frank, uh, what do you do when the prospect calls back? You don't know his or her name. I just be really honest. Uh, hey, Frank, uh, uh, apologies. I know I probably gave you a call, but I called a few other people today. Uh, can I get a second to look up your information real quick? I want to make sure to have a, a really good conversation with you. Right, you can use that. How to stop using fillers is a question that uh, Panchal direct messaged me. You know what I'm working on right now is not saying like so much. I probably said it a bunch in this call, but I literally have a reminder on my phone. Make sure you're not saying like. So it just requires just daily discipline and thinking about it, putting it on your whiteboard or your cell phone or your desktop, whatever it is, the filler words that you use, put that right in front of you. Uh, you could put a white note or a sticky note next to your camera up here too. <sighs> yeah, Mohammed asked how much is the bootcamp? The bootcamp's $999. You guys get 100% off or 100% uh, off, a $100 off coupon if you came here. There's also a course version of it for 299 bucks. So that's the pricing. Um, yeah, I think that's everything you, you guys. I appreciate everyone coming here. I'll send the replay out to you. Hope to see some of you in the boot camp. Um, it's a really fun time, and uh, you get to get feedback, you know, from me on this kind of stuff. And it's very much like this setting in a much much smaller group. So uh, let me know if I can help you guys out.
appreciate you hopping on and uh, I'll get an email over to you later today. I'll see you later, everyone. Thanks for your time.